I'm delighted to see each of you on the screen, but I dedicated, I'm, I'm going to start dedicating my teaching to somebody each day. And as I was preparing this Psalm, I, um, Jack Pariser came to mind for his honesty and uh, courageous a willingness to speak out regarding God as the challenger of uh, his most recent question regarding a psalm, isn't this naive, in terms of a quality of not challenging God. Today is the most challenging of all the psalms of God, and you, Jack, came to mind, and with that, each psalm will be dedicated to somebody. I'll start at 931 formally, so as to have the same amount. So in about 30 seconds, I'll start. But again, I, I think Mark, it's good to see you, and Phyllis, and Barbara, and Julia, and Marion, and Mary, Mimi, and Chuck, and Sarah, and Cliff, and Marvin, and Hal, Arnold. Thank you each for joining. Rabbi, there's still Psalm a day on Thursday, right? Correct. Just um, today and tomorrow. So I want to welcome everybody to Psalm 77, which is distinctive of all the Psalms in terms of the quality of questions of the divine. You'll see there'll be three sentences that are question after question of where is God? And at the same time, the commentators, as you might imagine, are quite diverse in how they understand the nature of these questions. I am reminded of how we all wear lenses with which we experience life and to write a poem on an artful level is to write a poem that has the possibility of different lenses, different readers finding different meanings. I remember as a freshman in college English hearing my first poet present and somebody saying to this poet, is this what you intended when you wrote the poem and the poet and the poet said, it's not relevant what I intended. What matters is what you drive from my words, which have their own life. And so in this regard, Psalm 77, you'll see, is quite evocative. But we can't know what the poet really had in mind. And as you'll see from the commentaries, they will understand them quite differently Asaf, and this is another one of those Asaf poems, is particularly adept and difficult, much more difficult than the David Psalms as literary compositions. Difficult in that they often are elliptical, which means there's often gaps in the message. There are word plays. There's, the there's repetition of words. There is greater room for interpretation and edginess in the Asaf Psalms, of which there are a dozen. Eleven here, and this the third book of Psalms, and then Psalm 50, which stood alone. One more comment, and then I'll read the Psalm, and that is the nature of my translating. For me, part of the journey of this opportunity of sharing has been doing my own translations. I look at as many as 10 and to some degree see which one of those translations or words resonates for me. And then sometimes do my own thing. And I'll point out a couple of places. But I will say that in what I'm about to read, you'll feel at times that it's a bit disjointed. That is in part the nature of Asaf's 
writing. He leaves room for um, filling in the blanks, sort of speaking, but it's also the nature of Hebrew. So, for instance, in Hebrew, you can say a the adjective can come after the noun. So it can be kelev gadol, right? Dog big. In English, we would say a big dog. So I try in my translation to keep the word order of the psalmist when I can, because that sometimes shows the rhythm that he's creating. But it makes for a less literary flow than doing it as many or even most translations do, which is more of an English flow. So I point that out as I now turn to first read this psalm and uh, give you a feel. This one's 21 verses in contrast to tomorrow. So tomorrow with um, Psalm 78, that's the second of the longest psalms which is 72 verses, which is why we'll just do, that one took a lot of prep. So now our focus. Psalm 77, I entitle, When I Recall God, I Moan, which is taken from the psalm. From the beginning of the psalm, this psalm is of two parts, verses 1 to 10, are deeply personal, in which he, the psalmist, is in despair and asking, where are you, God? And then verses 11 to 21, the second half with a bridge, is national, recounting God as the deliverer from Egypt with many echoes of Psalm of the Sea and the description of the God's helping hand. Hand will be a key image, as well as foot. For this psalm, based on the last, second to last phrase, Benjamin Siegel will call, your footsteps left no trace. And I'll come back to that phrase. But now, Psalm 77. For the conductor on Yudithun, a psalm of Asaph. My voice to God, I cried out. My voice to God who gives ear to me. In a day of my straits, my supreme, I have sought with my hand. All night it flowed and never ceasing. Refusing to be comforted was my spirit. When I recall God, I moan. I converse and faint becomes my spirit, Sela. You have grasped my eyelids. I have been agitated and do not speak. I have pondered days of old, years of endless past. I recall my melody at night. With my own heart, I converse and search with my life breath. Quote, forever will Adonai reject and not continue to find favor evermore? Is it as nothing indefinitely God's kindness? Is completed God's word for generation to generation? Has forgotten graciousness ail? Has clenched off in anger God's compassions? Selah. And I said, my prayer is this, changes of right, most high, Unquote. I recall the deeds of Yah, for I recall of old your wonders, and I meditate on all your work and on your doings. I converse. God in holiness is your way. Who is Ale, great like God? You are the Ale who works wonders. You have made known among the peoples your strength. You redeemed with your arm your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Sela, seeing you were the waters, God. Seeing you, the waters were terrified. Even trembling were the depths. Pouring forth waters were clouds. A voice was given by the skies. Even your arrows went back and forth. Voice 
of your thunder amidst the wheel, they lit up bolts, the world trembled, and the earth shook. In the sea was your way, and your path in mighty waters, and your heel marks were not known. You led as a flock your people, quote, by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now, clearly, this psalm begins with extraordinary anguish and challenge. The parallels most closely in terms of this quality of challenge is Psalm 44 and more broadly the book of Lamentations chapters 3 and 5. 520 is an example from the book of Lamentations, Echa. Why have you forgotten us eternally, forsaken us for all time? The book of Lamentations is ascribed to being written just after the destruction of the first temple. Some scholars saying the voice of Jeremiah, though it is anonymous. This Psalm 2, many classic commentators will identify as the aftermath of that same moment, the aftermath of the destruction of the first temple. Though again, with Asaph, unlike some of the David Psalms, there is no particular biblical moment that can be certainly identified in the introduction or even in a reference. For later rabbis, this Psalm will be understood prophetically. Again, for the rabbis, back to lenses, reading this psalm in the Middle Ages, like Rashi, France, 11th century, he will see this as a psalm of, the, of galut, of exile. That here, this could be words in any moment of somebody longing for the songs of old, Verse 7, I recall my melody at night. Rashi will comment that melody at night were the songs of the temple. We'll come back to that image of sleeplessness. But back to when this was written, we don't know. What we do know is that it can be read clearly as a time of anguish and in which on the second half, possibility of some comfort. So let me begin from the beginning. Here again is where you get, you know, koli elo, el Elohim ve'etzaka, koli Elohim ve'azin elai. So the repetition of the voice, my voice, there's this sense of calling out to God and that same word, kol, voice, will be the envelope. You'll find it in verses 18 and 19. A voice was given by the skies, voice of your thunder. Here it's the voice of God acting in nature. So it opens with the voice of the psalmist. It closes with the voice twice again parallel, but the voice of God. But here, his voice is calling out to God. Give the ear, meaning, you know, pay close attention. And here, put in the back of your mind, we don't know in the psalm itself whether what he is calling out gets answered. We can only surmise and Psalmists will surmise it in two ways. But I can't help myself but start with the punchline. There's a two-volume work by Art Scroll, 1,700 pages, on Psalms. Again, that's orthodox, even ultra-orthodox um, setting, the Masora uh, context. And here... Let me read to you from the introduction to Psalm 77. The psalmist searches through the chronicles of ancient Jewish history to demonstrate that God saved Israel even in the bleakest moments. 
since the Almighty wrought miracles of salvation in the past, why does God not perform miracles in the present exile? Certainly, He, capital H, remains omnipotent. However, it is God's wish to wring every last tear from our eyes, to squeeze every last cry of repentance from our hearts, so that we might be thoroughly worthy of the final total redemption. May it come speedily in our times. So in this case, this commentary, the lenses is, these are Yisurin Shal Ahava, afflictions of love, which we've talked about previously, and that the psalmist will find faith by recalling the past. Benjamin Siegel, a conservative rabbi living in Israel, in his commentary to this, takes a different perspective on the flow, and he says it's a question mark whether the tension is ever resolved. And I'll come back to the closing image. I'll do it here to make us aware. The last two lines, in the sea was your way and your path in mighty waters. That's again, God leading us out of slavery. And then the last line, you led us as a flock, your people, and I put in quotation marks, by the hand of Moses and Aaron, for that phrase is a quote by Biyad Moshe of Aharon. It's Numbers chapter 33, verse 1, when the journeys of the Israelites in the desert are recounted. And so it ends with, quote, echoing the only other place that you get that phrase, to say, and from being brought through the waters, Moses and Aaron would continue to lead the people toward the promised land. But here's the mystery line, and your, I translate it very literally. Here it is in Hebrew first. V'ikvotecha lo nodau. Literally it is, and your heel marks were not known. Now, heel marks, which is literal, akev is a heel, is often translated as your steps were not known, your footsteps were not known, or as again, some translate, your footsteps left no trace. Why did God's footsteps leave no trace? The classic commentators, Rashi and Radak, 11th, 12th century, say it's because after the miracle of the splitting of the sea, the water washed backwards, and so there was no footsteps to be seen. But Benjamin Siegel, he again reads this with attention. Is it your heel marks were not known? They were known then, but they're not known now. Then you walked us through, but now I don't see your heel steps. I don't see your footsteps. In that regard, my friend Brad Artson told me a story many years ago that relates to footsteps. And then I'm going to go back through the psalm and point out some of the flow. Here's a story that he was told in his college dorm about footsteps in God. A person is walking along the shore with God. At some point, looking back, he sees a stretch with the two pairs of footprints side by side. But he also sees a patch with just a single pair of footsteps. He says to God, you said you would never abandon me, yet here I appear to have walked alone. God says, those footprints were mine. That was where I was carrying you. And so this image of footprints, be it understood as literally the waters washed back. Samson Raphael Hirsch, the commentator 
Frankfurt, Germany, 19th century, will say nature reverted back to normalcy after the miracles. And so therefore we don't often see the imprint or is it something more remarkable or open as tension. So I'll come back to that to pull it together, but from the beginning, pointing out some of the artistry of the psalm itself. Repetition, as in verse 2, is for emphasis. My voice to God I cried out. My voice to God who gives ear to me. A quality of urgency. In a day of tsarat, tsuris, a day of straits, of narrowness, Adonai, my supreme, I have sought with my hand. And again, elliptical and the translations will differ as to where you break up a sentence, but it seems to be the hand is the position of prayer, reaching out toward God. I have sought you, reaching out to you. All night it flowed, never ceasing. Again, elliptical, usually understood as all night tears flowed, never ceasing. King James Version will see it as my wound flowed. Refusing to be comforted was my spirit. When I recall God, I moan. And here too, repetition of words is part of the artistry. Verse 4 begins, when I recall. Verse 7, when I recall. And so, I recall God, I moan. And why is he moaning? Not clear. Is he moaning because God is absent? Or is he moaning because of a longing and a memory? Likewise, ambiguity. Asicha. I translate more literally. That's again my proclivity is to be more literal, allowing for ambiguity and possibilities of other understandings. I converse. Here to ambiguity. Is he conversing with God or is he conversing with the people around him? Not clear. And faint becomes my spirit. I become weakened. Why? Out of lack of faith? Out of forcing myself to still defend you? Unclear. You have grasped my eyelids. Shmurot enai. Shemura means watchfulness of the eye, just like our eyelids protect our eye. So shmurot enai are eyelids. That's a sense of insomnia. He's not able to sleep. It's as if God and his, is keeping him awake at night. I have been agitated. And again, a, throughout this also with Asaf, there's often a shift in tenses that add to, this, to the opportunity to translate in multiple ways. It's not only words that are multivalent, it's even the grammar. And nonetheless, I've been agitated and do not speak. I have pondered days of old, years of endless past. Six, foreshadowing verses 11 to 22. So as I stay open, awake at night, I think of the past, an endless past. Shnot olamin, the years of the world. I recall my melody at night. And here too, what is the melody being recalled? I noted Rashi says it's the sounds of joy in the temple, but other possibilities. It could be the taunts of those around him, or it could be prayers that had soothed him, or it could be simply melodies to himself to try to make himself fall asleep at night. With my own heart, now he's going inward. I converse and search with my life breath. And now three verses of questions but are different than the Book of Lamentations. In the Book of Lamentations, the challenges are to God. Here, they're self-reflective. Forever will Adonai reject and not continue to find favor evermore? 
Is it as nothing indefinitely God's kindness? Meaning, has God, say again, is God's kindness as nothing? Meaning, is it gone? But the Hebrew here, this poetic Hebrew, is a little bit nonlinear. Is completed God's word for generation to generation? Has forgotten graciousness, Ale? Has clenched off in anger God's compassions? And the word kafatz, which I translate as clenched off, literally is used as the verb for clenching a fist. And that is resonating here. Has God clenched a fist in anger, shutting off compassion? And now a shift. And here, check out this verse 11 is the key bridge. And look at the ambiguity. And I said, now he's talking to himself, my prayer is this. I put his prayer as three words. Shnot yamin elyon. Changes of right most high. Implicit of right is right hand. May changes of the right hand most high. May you, right hand, the right, is identified with God's strength in the song of the sea. So, you assert your right most high. Others see the prayer as verses 11 to 13. Others see the prayer as verse 11, but begins the quote with, my prayer is this, changes of right most high, but even the word changes. Here, let me show you two words in verse 11 that are subject to remarkable varieties of interpretation. And I said, my prayer is this. The understanding of Chaloti as prayer is Sforno, Italy, 1475 to 1550. Rashi translates Chaloti from the Hebrew Chil as my terror is this. And Rashi will explain that God has provided terror as a prompt for repentance. Another way to understand the word chaloti, radak, 12th century, is halal, corpse. And I am like a corpse, meaning I may never emerge alive. Psikta de Rav Kahana, which is an early Midrasha compilation, 5th to 8th centuries of the Common Era, has it from the word chilul, and I said, my desecration is this. So take the word chaloti, at least four different variations of what is the root of the Hebrew among important translators. Shnot, likewise, here, two different, very different ways of understanding it. Rashi understands it as changes of right, so as to prompt repentance. But Radak is the other years of your right hand most high is what I remember. So that's an example, verse 11. Two key words, Chaloti and Shenot, with different trajectories of possibility. Well, we're almost out of time, and so I'm just going to begin to pull it together to acknowledge that many of these verses echo Exodus, particularly the Song of the Sea. But here's a, an, a, two interesting things. Verse 16, you redeemed with your arm your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. Why the children of Joseph? The Talmud, Sanhedrin 19b, will use this as the proof text, this phrase, the children of Jacob and Joseph. And they will say, Joseph provided for his siblings when they were in Egypt. That's our Torah reading at the moment. And if somebody raises an orphan, it is as if they are identified as their biologic parents. 
So the proof for adopting a child, they become fully your own, is verse 16 in the Talmud. The children of Jacob and Joseph, when you provide, it's as if you are the biologic parent. The image of the chariot of verse 19, voice of your thunder amidst the wheel. What is this wheel? Some say it's the sound of a wheel spinning. That's Rashi. Radak says it could be at least two things. It could be that the Egyptian wheels came off in the mud, or it's the sound of the celestial forces, the sun, the clouds moving to bring the rain. So let me pull this together with one other quote at the very end. Verse 22. Mitsuda David was a rabbi born in Yavora of Ukraine, died in Prague, 1687 to 1769. He says of the last verses, in these final verses, the psalmist presents proofs from Jewish history that God can create a wondrous redemption of universal proportions. Therefore, if God is not delivered as it can only be a result of our shortcomings, Obviously, we have not improved ourselves sufficiently and therefore must endure further afflictions until our purification has been completed and we have become all that God desires us to be. Again, that's in Prague in the 18th century. This, for him, for the Mitsuda David, is a psalm of exile, a psalm in which our suffering is real, and yet there is reason to remember the past, to know God's power, so as to return to God and to be purified. And the other way that I read this, two other ways. One is as, the, as a Holocaust survivor. This is a psalm written after a trauma. The Jewish people with the destruction of the first temple were killed in large numbers, sold into slavery, their independence taken, their place of worship destroyed. There is anguish, not unlike the Holocaust, where somebody can say, I am moaning in this loss and wondering, where is God? I do remember the past, but I don't see your footsteps now. Your heel marks were or are not known. The other way to read it is somewhere in between. And that's to say, from Holocaust survivors I have known, a vacillating. What they hold onto is belonging to community. By the hand of Moses and Aaron means that you led as a flock your people. That's speaking to God. But God acts through history. God acts through God's servants that we don't necessarily see God immediately before us, but the belonging to an ancient people, the sense that there is a mystery to history is reason for hope that yet history with God's hand coupled with people who are inspired to lead on behalf of God will resolve the horror of the present for a better future. With that, I now have so much more I could say about this psalm, but I look to see what questions or reactions this psalm might have prompted for you in hearing it. Alex, go right ahead. And, and uh, yeah, this psalm um, reminds me of the book of Eel, of the culmination of the book of Eel, uh, where, you know, where, where Eel is, is asked, demanding from God, where's, where's the justice? Where's, you know, where's, the, where's your justice? Where's your compassion? Why have you made me suffer? And, and Hashem re responds, I created the universe. Yeah. 
I created the stars in the skies and the and the Bahamon and and uh, and this seems to, to be sort of the same kind of uh, question or response in the song. So, Alex shares that this psalm resonates with a pattern, an echo, not only of the book of Lamentations, but with the questioning, the book of Job. And I would affer uh, underscore that to be the case, that what I gain even from Psalms, and this is again probably the most challenging within himself, his own faith in God, the notion of challenging the world not fitting a clean picture of a caring God is part of Job, it's part of the book of Lamentations. What's distinctive in this psalm is the sense of these ruminations on his bed at night, a sleepless bed at night, in which when he thinks of God, he moans. That's, um, again, has a similar and a different feel. Other Shula, Cantor Shula. Um, I was looking at verse 11, yeah. which you called the bridge. Yes. And it really is. And what I wanted to say is that the word chaloti also has a meaning, I long, mm. longing. And so it really sets up what comes after. He says, uh, I, I long for the years, shnot yamim. You know, yamim, the, the final nun often in, in biblical writings interchanges with the final mem. So the years of days of God and in verse 12. And so I'm going to remind you what it is that I long for mm. that was so great in the things that he did. And then by verse 14, he comes to what it is he longed for and what it is he's reminding of, which is really some of the context of Shirat Hayam, Song of the Sea, greatest God of all, etc., etc. Lovely. So let me build on Shula's insight and her sensitivity to the language. First thing to note is that in verses 1 to 10, it's always I, um, and God is in the third person. Here, with verse 11, there's a shift, and as Shula points out, it's now God being addressed. The psalmist is now talking to God, and from verse 11 on, it's in the second person. It's you, you, God. And the idea that here, um, my longing is this, he's saying it to God. And even what gets chosen to be put in quotes um, is talking as prayer, as an expression of longing to God. And again, it can be years of days most High, I long for a time in which you, Most High, are as present as you were at the Sea of Redemption. Because what will follow are literally phrases from Exodus, Song of the Sea. Again, that's the power of Asaf's poetry. He will use words of the Bible um, to build the message of continuity, of longing, of equality, of connection to God in this case. Thank you, Shula. Other, uh, other uh, uh, comments? Uh, to, uh, Hal? Re to, <clears throat> to reiterate what you were saying about verse 5, about uh, oh, lifting up our eyelids, uh, yes. that uh, we're not allowed to turn away. He refuses to allow us to turn away mm. from whatever is terrible or whatever uh, horrors uh, have existed or do exist. And we can't even uh, turn away from God because he forces our eyelids open. It's an unusual image, I guess, uh, that uh, you uh, hit upon there in that verse five. Yeah. You know, I, I love that, Hal. Um, it's... Um, a, a powerful image, the way it resonates for you, which is um, you have grasped my eyelids. And it's 
It's not clear. It can either be grasp them to keep them open, saying you must look. And that's why I have been agitated, right? So it can be read also as a double entendre. Either you've closed my eyelids to mean, you know, um, you're holding my eyelids so that I can't fall asleep. Or it can be you're holding my eyelids so that I won't look away from the reality around me. Um, powerful. And both are possible. And this psalm resonates for me powerfully precisely because of these double entendres. There's this quality of agitation and a looking back in the history, particularly of the Exodus, and the question, is it resolved fully? Is it resolved not at all? Or does he then begin to vacillate in light of personal, national, and then those last couple of verses? And that's powerful spiritual poetry. One last comment. Vivian, I just want to say how happy I am to see you today. Do you want to add something? That makes me happy. Go ahead, Vivian. You got to unmute. You got to unmute still, Vivian. Well, I wasn't really raising my hand, just leaning my forehead, but I will say that since you are interested in the in the afterlife of some of these psalms, I hear it, and I don't know if others have. I hear in it the famous footstep of the single footstep of Robinson Crusoe's Friday, when he discovers he has a companion. The way that he discovers it is to see a single footprint which he cannot explain or know. And he never does. It never is explained. Because Defoe was so committed to using biblical material, mostly, I will say, Pilgrim's Progress and New Testament, but also, also Torah, um, I, it seems to me that that is that that inexplicable, otherwise inexplicable footprint is one that I will carry from your reading. Thank you. I Thank I wasn't you. raising my hand, but oh, I but feel so it glad. so strongly. And my husband Bob, who was an expert in Robinson Crusoe, would have been able to tell us. Well, yes, everybody knows that, or only Rabbi Spitz could have given it to you. So <laughs> what can we say? A mystery or, there, or, or in this case, Vivian, only Psalm 77 could have evoked it. And I am yeah. delighted again to see you and your literary trajectory that leads you to. So I want to just pull this together by saying this is the punchline, however you may understand it. Your heel marks were not known. And I'm going to change this to being because, again, it can be your heel marks are not known. And I would prefer, I'm going to change it to are not known because I think that leaves one with the question at the end. And that is when and how does one go see God's presence in the world? In the Wikipedia, um, they will say, in summarizing the message of this psalm, as the psalmist learned to look for, was looking for God in the wrong places. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. And so I delight in having had this opportunity to honor my dear friend and teacher, Jack Pariser, a Holocaust survivor who has taught me that in his town in Poland, the most pious are the ones who were killed. And those in some cases, as in the case of his parents, his sister and himself in hiding, they survived not because they were the most religious. And the whole question of where is God in theodicy, in the world, in justice, resonates in a distinctive way, in a very personal way, in Psalm 77, coupled with national memory and leading us to a place that allows us as the reader to choose how we see God in God's 
presence and in God's absence, which might also be presence. So we conclude our studies with Kaddish. Tomorrow is the second of the longest Psalms. It took a lot, a lot, a lot of time to translate it because it's another Asaf Psalm with many, you know, kind of multivalent words and ellipses. Oh God, it's, it's something. It's a review of about 300 years of Jewish history from Moses to King David gets encapsulated, but not in a linear way, as memory and not as history. So I'll look to share that tomorrow. We'll go a little longer tomorrow and nothing on Thursday to recuperate. So I now bring up the Kaddish for those who would like to honor the memory of a loved one through our gathering. Yitkadal Thank you each for starting your day together in learning. Happy birthday, Cantor Shula. May it be a sweet day for you. Maybe a sweet day for all of us.